Welcome back to another episode of the Zealous Podcast. This week, I've got Blake Bender. He's the Assistant Performance Director at the University of California, Berkeley, in charge of the men's basketball team and the women's tennis team. We're going to talk all about basketball and tennis and what it's like in the college ranks. Hope you enjoy. Be sure to subscribe. Uh, I just want to say first, thanks for coming on, Blake. This is great because you are actually... The second guest I've had in in the college ranks, but now that college athletes can get sponsors and so on, the the blend between professional and college sports are are kind of melding together. I guess we'll we'll kind of encompass zealous into both fields. I had Kelly Dormandy, who is down in Loyola Marymount uh, earlier this year, but to have somebody representing the Cal Bears, that sounds good to me. So welcome to the show. Yeah, well, I appreciate you uh, having me on. And like you said, the the college landscape is certainly changing. And I'm not sure I can quite keep up with it myself, but I'll do my best. Um, But again, thanks for having me on. This this is a pleasure of mine to be here. Yeah, why don't we just talk about that right now? Like, how is the college landscape changing? Because it is changing rapidly with the new rules established with the NCAA and, and federal government for that matter. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the biggest thing is it changes recruiting a lot. I think the transfer portal has, has really changed the landscape of college sports and kids can be, uh, you know, more selective once they've started college about where they want to play. Um, so I feel like, you know, we're recruiting year round now um, as opposed to, to how it was. You know, we've had visits the last few weekends here um, and it's just really about kids are trying to find good fits. Um there's a lot more that they can receive with the um, NIL uh, legislation that got passed. Um, that's well beyond me. Um, but I would say the biggest thing for sport performance coaches is, and athletic performance coaches is the recruiting calendar has really expanded. Um, and, and we're always on the clock and uh, we're always trying to recruit count, talent as well as develop it. So it's, uh, it's quite the blend between the two. So being one of the assistant strength conditioning coaches there at Cal Berkeley, How does that expanding of recruitment affect uh, your work with the athletes? Do you now have to change program design or change your calendar based on that? Yeah, you know, I I don't try to to mix the two um, as much. Um, But what I will say in in recruitment, it it kind of affects, you know, the the long-term plan and the athletic plan, development plan that we have for each guy. So, um, you know, typically in college, a, a student athlete would come and hopefully spend four years with you. Um, if they're talented enough to go professional, obviously less than that. Um, but really what it does is it shortens our window um, of, you know, developing talent. And um, obviously we're trying to stay ahead on recruiting talent as well. So for me, I, you know, instead of having long drawn out four-year plans, um, it's really changed the way I think about programming um, and I try to put the athletes in in the most successful positions possible when it comes to programming out in their long-term development um, you know and still trying to do it the right way um, and build them correctly but yeah it definitely speeds up uh, that timeline for sure. And is that something that you struggle with with LTAD long-term athletic development is that you are now trying to kind of condense these elements of athletic performance when in truth, maybe they need more time to really mature. Do you find yourself kind of battling that? Yeah, I think so. And and I think it's easy to kind of get caught up in the the speed of the process uh, per se. You know, I think when, especially a young male, you know, I work with the the men's basketball team here, when they come to college, they're still maturing uh, physically, um, you know, a lot, and that could take some time. You know, I, we know that men mature a little bit later than, than women do. So, you know, a lot of that is just time um, and time spent with them and, and their development. So, like I said, I, you know, we still think we try to do it the right way. Um, I think it's a balance between getting results. I would say I'm a very results-driven individual, um, but we also want to prepare for their long-term success. And when you're at a place like Cal, um, most of our student athletes are here for the long term and to get their degree and develop both academically and physically. Um, so for me personally, that that's helped, you know, kind of with our long term planning um, and, and just putting our athletes on a path for success in the future. 
But what are the other sports that you oversee in terms of program design and athletes? Yeah, so I only have two. I, you know, men's basketball is my primary responsibility, and I, I also work with the women's tennis program. Um, and, and shout out to them. They got the Sweet 16s coming up this uh, this weekend. So, you know, it's another highly successful program, a highly motivated group. Um, the girls are, are really on top of their training and their fitness. So it's it's a joy to work with them as well. And, and when we talk about tennis programming for them, what were what were the key elements that you were trying to to implement in the program for this season? Uh, obviously, they have such great athletic prowess and and competition to get them where they are. But we know that the the bedrock also is is training conditioning. So what was it that that helped that? Yeah, I think the number one uh, area of training that, that we wanted to focus on was just their level of fitness. And we felt like, you know, I came to Cal during a COVID year um, where things were kind of jumbled and it was hard to really develop um, in a broad scale. So this year being my second year, we, we really focused on fitness, um, the, the aerobic system, building a base in the fall, transitioning that into the anaerobic systems, um, you know, as, as we go throughout the season, but tennis, you know, in terms of strength and conditioning is quite similar to basketball. Um, it's a lot of short movements and short spaces. It's very three-dimensional. It's reactive. Um, there's power elements and expressions of power. Um, you know, and I would say probably the obvious big difference is it's, it's a non-contact sport where basketball, there's a lot of wrestling and contact that, that needs to be handled. So for tennis, I think the number one thing we focus on, um, is the fitness level. And then second, you know, the movement quality, and then third, you know, building the strength, um, and, and the power expression, uh, from that. I'm curious, Blake, you, you came from the Southeast, North Carolina, came to California. Is there a difference in fitness levels between Southeast populations and West Coast populations? That's a very interesting question. Um, you know, one thing about being in the South and, um, you know, working for a sport like tennis that's outdoor is the humidity factor um, mm-hmm. and, and the fitness level required, you know, and our girls will travel to Texas and Florida to play. Um, You know, they'll travel these places. Last year nationals was in Orlando. Um, And so the fitness level and the ability to handle heat, um, you know, and make sure that you're hydrated and and things of that nature are really important. But I would say in, in terms of the athletic quality, I think California is a place that's rich in athletic culture. Um, You know, California puts out tons of, of high achieving athletes every year in multiple sports. Um, and so I think the athletic qualities of, of you know, kids coming to college is, is pretty similar between California and the Southeast for sure. Well, especially in D1 schools, I'm kind of thinking also of like um, D2, D3 and under that, you were talking about more of a general population of those that are not performing at the same level as say D1 athletes that you're accustomed to. But we have this trend in our country toward more and more weight gain, less and less active lifestyle. And I, I'm, it's kind of a long-winded explanation or lead up to the question, but I'm wondering, are you starting to see that? Not necessarily in your players. I'm not trying to pin anybody under the bus or anything, but just in the general college sense. And you walk around the campus and you see, do you see that the demographics for D1 players are getting narrower and narrower as the nation gets larger and less active? Yeah, you know, I think the dichotomy of that, and I think you explained it well, um, is is very interesting. And I think that, especially at the the Division I level, the selection process and the talent recruitment is extremely specific. Um, and, and it's not uncommon for certain programs to look for someone of a specific height with a specific wingspan to fill kind of the needs, you know, of their team. Uh, and, and I think you bring up an interesting point about kind of the culture in general when it comes to athletics and, and maybe it's broadening at a general population level and in athletes, it's becoming more specific, um, you know, which could be a, a whole nother topic. But I think what we're seeing at the college level is the athletes that are incoming are already highly specified in their sport. Um, you know, especially in basketball and we see it in tennis as well as these student athletes have been playing this one sport for many, many years already. 
So although they're very developed in sport, they're not quite athletically developed as a whole in general. And, you know, that's something where I think my job becomes super important. And I think it even trickles down. And I would argue to say that at the high school level is even more important um, in developing just a general base of athleticism is really getting highlighted because what we see is, is I can get someone in the, who's incoming that's really highly skilled at basketball, um, but as a human and as a mover and as a general athlete, they might not be so skilled. And I think the trend is definitely going that way. And I would argue that sports specificity is, is definitely, um, you know, equating to some of those, those qualities that we're seeing or lack thereof. Yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing when it comes to the athletes coming into your ranks from high schools. I can just think in, in my region here in Santa Cruz County, we've got a number of high schools. And within those, there is a wide variety of sport coaches and not too many strength and conditioning specialists. In fact, I don't know how many schools actually have those individuals helping with the athletes. So it, it, you typically see conditioning programs that are probably something that's dated back into the 80s or even 70s or it, maybe the 90s, which all have their different flair and flavor. So you're getting a, a high number of your athletes coming in with great sports skill but not necessarily the same level of athletic conditioning and ability. So how do you, how do you sort through that? How do you take those individuals that need a little bit more of the basic fundamentals of athleticism and get them up to where you need them to be? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when student athletes arrive, we're assessing them from the minute they step on campus and it even starts in the recruitment process just by watching them come in the building and, and, watching them maybe shoot on the court and just seeing kind of how they're moving. Um, and that's something that I learned from Todd Wright, who I believe was on your podcast, is just looking at the way that these athletes are moving, you know, on a casual day-to-day -day basis. And so the assessment starts then, um, you know, and then when they arrive to campus, we, we do some more assessments and we identify some deficiencies. But I would say in a more broad and, and general way, my programming and kind of my philosophy is really in the more years that I'm doing this is, is getting more simplified into just athletic development as a whole and everything that goes into it with the, the idea that you are, you're building up to basketball specific or sports specificity as you go. But I don't think that you can truly achieve high levels of sports specificity and strength conditioning training without a broad base of athletic development. So I would say of all the assessments we do and, and all the things we're looking at, it's not really changing my belief that we're still gonna start a freshman that comes in and work on athletic qualities um, and build him to what the seniors are doing. And, and what I tell recruits and what I tell guys is, is everything in, in athleticism is still a motor skill. And it's something that can be learned and it's something that can be practiced. And that includes running and cutting and jumping. And so those are all skills that we're still going to work on. Um, and I, I hear the arguments that we shouldn't jump, you know, too much and we shouldn't cut too much because they're already playing so much basketball. And I hear that. Um, but I think we still need to teach those skills and we need to teach them correctly. Um, and we need to educate, you know, our student athletes. So everything's a motor skill. Um, if it's trainable, we're going to train it. We're going to practice it. And, and we're going to try to achieve higher levels of it, you know, before we move on to the sports specificity piece. Well, I think your injury rate would probably be one of the overall barometers of determining if there is too much of this or too little of that. Uh, what was your injury rate this season? Wow, put me on the spot. Um, Hell yeah, you know, come we, on now. We, <laughs> we fared pretty well. Um, you know, I think our, our COVID year, we were, we were hanging on by a thread, um, you know, putting some Band-Aids on things. But having the off season um, after that really allowed us to develop some different qualities. Um, outside of contact injuries, I think, you know, our, our injury rate was fairly low. I, I apologize. I can't give you a specific number. Um, but our, I think our availability was above, you know, 90% for the year. Um, and, and we'll take that. And just keeping in mind, we're controlling the things we can control. Things happen, yeah. contact injuries happen. Um, and so we're pretty proud of the work we do. Um, that being said, there's always room for improvement and, and we're always looking, um, you know, to achieve higher levels of that. So 
like I said, we're proud. Uh, we got some work to do. Uh, and I think, you know, having another off season, especially with these guys, uh, is really going to pay off for us. You mentioned Todd Wright. And yeah, he was on a, a few weeks back. I had him on the episode with the LA Clippers. And one thing Todd said is, I don't know if there's anybody that, assesses more than I do. I look at every aspect and so on. So, and you've already, Blake, you've mentioned assessments too. I'm kind of curious, are there some go-to assessments like where your, your background and, and your experience, what are the, the assessment tools that you have in your back pocket that you almost always pull out when it's time to assess players? Oh, I hope I make Todd proud with this answer. Um, but you know, your, your feet are what you play sport with primarily in basketball. Obviously there's the skill of, of shooting and passing and dribbling, um, but basketball is a running sport um, at its bare bones. So uh, what we do a lot is we look at the foot ankle complex when they walk in. Um, I love to look at the way a guy lands. That'll give me some indications of what lower body muscles may be weak or tight, um, inactive or overactive. Um, and then we just really work up the chain. Um, we look at the way a guy squats. Um, you know, we look at the way a guy presses the bar overhead. We look at the, the shoulder movement. Um, and so we're looking kind of at everything up the chain, starting with the feet, because what we believe is, is the feet are the things that contact the ground all the time. Um, that's where everything starts. And we really work, you know, kind of bottom up from there. Um, that's a, a specific answer. And I think, a a more broad general way to think about it is we are assessing everything. And in terms of an athletic performance program, um, we, we assess much more than the, the physical nature of the athlete. We're assessing the nutrition, we're assessing the recovery, uh, we're assessing the way our athletes are sleeping, we're assessing the amount of work they're doing on the court, um, we're assessing how school is affecting them, which is a huge deal at the college level, and especially when you work at a place like Cal. Um, we're assessing their mental states um, and how they're feeling and their subjectivity toward things, you know, so it's in terms of athletic performance, of course, we're looking at the body and, and we're working in strength and conditioning, but we're assessing everything that goes into any output of performance for these athletes and trying to make it better. So in the off season, you know, that's a big goal of ours is, is to get things up to speed if they're not to reassess, reevaluate, look in the mirror and say what's working, what's not and, and moving forward. Well, I think Todd would be very proud of that answer. And I know my heart, <laughs> heart is singing a little bit because I definitely go from the ground up and foot mechanics and chain reaction all the way through. It, it's just, that's what we land on. That's what we push off the planet from. So if something isn't working, we're going to start there and work our way up. But I love the other assessments that you just mentioned. I mean, talk about complete athlete. That's the beautiful thing about your job in a college environment that may not occur at the professional level because some pros have their own trainers, they have their own coaches, they can use a whole bunch of smart wearable tech, but they don't have to share it with their staff. And, and there's a lot of like uh, questions and what ifs, and, but the compliance level for your players uh, is just through the roof, I can only imagine. So with all those other assessments, the which ones are the ones that are kind of new to your toolbox? Which are the ones that you weren't thinking that eh, this, this might be informative, but actually turned out to be really informative? Are there anything like that? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I think one big shift that we're seeing at the collegiate strength and conditioning level or athletic performance level is the use of sport technologies um, in objectifying and, and generating data um, and looking at things from a numbers perspective. So one thing that we're utilizing is we utilize, uh, you know, when we talked about the way the foot ankle mechanics and ground reaction force, we utilize force plates. Um, and so our guys are jumping every time they're in the facility and we're just collecting data and interpreting it and analyzing it to see whatever we can find or whatever trends, um, you know, and I think one thing I would caution is it's really easy to collect and it's really easy to, look at one set of data and, and try to jump and make decisions based off that. But I try to take a much broader view. Um, and as you get to be familiar with these things, you know, you start looking at what makes sense for you. Um, and so I think that's one thing when we're looking at assessment is, is what's really going to cause behavior change that's needed. Uh, what are the needs and what's going to cause the behavior change? 
Um, and so for me, although we jump every day, and I think our force plates give us 52 metrics of one jump, um, by no means am I looking at all 52. Maybe I look at two to three um, and make informed decisions there. So I think that's one big trend in collegiate strength and conditioning and assessment is, is the use of, of sport technology. I would say the one thing that, that I've been taking more into account is just the subjective feeling that the athletes have. So we'll do wellness um, and health questionnaires once a week. Um, and those questions range from how are you sleeping? What is your mood? What is your stress level? For us here at Cal, you know, the academic piece is a super stressful piece and, it, and it's very important, um, much like any university. So, you know, weekly I'm getting that information and I'm trying to, to pair that subjective state with some of the objective data I'm seeing and try to, you know, piece the puzzle together per se. And then I think third, and, and this is something I learned at Florida from, from Preston Green, who's one of my mentors, is the nutritional piece. And, you know, I don't think anything we do from a performance standpoint um, is not linked to nutrition, um, whether it be fueling for performance, whether it be recovery from performance, whether it be supplementing the diet, um, hydrating, everything that we do, nothing of it can work without proper nutrition. So that's one area that we really focused on when we got to Cal was looking at the nutritional program from head to toe, seeing what we could do, what we could provide, um, supplementing, testing, getting blood work done for the athletes, um, all of those measures to try to improve kind of that athletic output. So I would say those three are, are kind of where we're looking, the sport technology, uh, the nutrition, you know, um, and, and those three are, are pretty much the big ones. Yeah, it, it, it makes you scratch your head when nutrition is now only now here we are in 2022 and we're we're just kind of marrying nutrition with athletic performance I, I know it's being done but I'm just thinking back to not too long ago even the professional levels and there there was not very much management or guidance and this is what we're fueling our athletes with so it, it just makes you shake your head going oh my gosh so good for Cal for actually taking a, a much more of a, a leadership role in, and provide some nutritional guidance and, and counseling and, and testing and assessing with that. But I, you, you mentioned a force plate. Now I've got a, a force plate in my facility, but I use it probably a lot different than yourself. I use it in terms of understanding mass management of a person's body and structure as they stand there in a resting posture or as they walk or run across it in regards to their gait pattern. I'm not looking for uh, contact time or speed of contractions necessarily, but I'm curious, do you use that to some degree when your players are doing jump uh, training and they're on the force plate? Are you looking at where the contact is, where the release points are and so on? Not exactly where the, the yeah. contact is. Um, it, it is a, a dual force plate. So we do look at right to left differences. Mm -hmm. um, I would say at a, at a deep level, we're breaking down eccentric strength, concentric strength, stretch shortening cycle. Um, and that's guiding some of our programming um, from an objective perspective. If a guy is, is really his breaking force is, is way different than his propulsive force, that's going to indicate to us that maybe we should do some more eccentric work uh, with that athlete. And then, you know, like I said, the right to left difference um, that comes into play with some of the return to play protocols that we have, um, you know, if anything happens to our athletes and, and we have a, a broad baseline because they're jumping every day is, is we can know pretty much where they're going to be um, on a timeline, you know, by having them kind of reintroduced to that. So um, I think that's great. The, the mapping piece is what you're saying in terms of yes. where the force is coming from. Um, I think that's an even deeper step. Um, and I think that's great work for us. It's just not completely practical right now. I'm not saying that we wouldn't do it, um, sure. you know, but there's a million things you can do. We're just looking at the ones that make sense to us right now. Truly. Um, but so I, what I about asymmetries? Great. Like you mentioned asymmetries. How do you address yeah. those asymmetries? And then the, the next question I have before it leaves my head is, did you notice in terms of stretch shortening reflex and, and the timing, did it vary based on position or height of players. So there's two things, yeah. asymmetry and the differences in stretch shortening. Yeah, I just wrote them down so I didn't forget. The asymmetry okay. piece, um, you know, what's funny is, is athletes predominantly have one side, especially as they become specialized. 
right? So, um, you know, very high level athletes usually prefer one side over the other. So in basketball, it may be a guy prefers jumping off his left versus his right. There are double leg jumpers, but those are things that, that we kind of find out. So, um, you know, when you look at one jump of an athlete and you have no other context and you say, hey, there's a big discrepancy here. This is what I was saying earlier. It would be really easy to try to say, hey, we got to throw everything on the table. We got to bring those to even. Well, that might actually hinder their performance, right? Because, you know, as a high level athlete, they may really excel by doing that quote unquote asymmetry action. So what we do is we just get the broadest baseline we can um, and base everything on trends um, and the baseline. So the asymmetries are important, like I said, for return to play. Um, also getting to know the athletes. Now, if there's a big structural um, inhibition on one side, obviously we're working to clean that up. Um, but again, that's where just the breadth of data that we collect is, is super important to us. So we can really start developing this holistic picture. Um, and then in terms of position and stretch shortening cycle, um, everyone jumps different. And this is where, like we talked about really early on, you know, jumping is still a motor skill. Some guys love to get really deep before they jump up. Some guys really have much higher reactive strength. Um, and so they can change side to side or they can double jump really quickly. Um, I don't see many differences from a position standpoint. And I think this is the nature of the game of basketball and where it's going is it's becoming more and more positionless. Um, we're seeing big men that are stretching the floor, that are shooting the ball, that are handling the ball up the floor. Um, you know, basketball is becoming much more positionless and much more athletic per se. Um, and so I don't see big differences as, as far as the groups. I see big differences in terms of the individual for sure. Okay. Then we talked about foot mechanics, but what about foot shape? You know, you look at the foot ankle complex, are you seeing some sort of of trend or suggestion that if the foot is, uh, say, a high rigid arch compared to one that is overly pronated or arches drop, you'll most likely say this one's going to have a slower contact time. This one will be more explosive. Do you see any correlation with that? Yes. Um, to to say that this is a direct correlation, I think would be incorrect. Um, but we do see correlations with a dropped fallen arch on some people's feet. Um, you know, but we'll, I will also say in taking a step back is the shoes uh, that people are wearing, especially basketball shoes, um, I think are a, a big area that people need to look at. So there's certain brands that may fit someone's foot differently. Um, we've seen it and I've seen it different places I've been. Um, just the ankle support, the foot support, the lack thereof of different types of shoes. Now, our guys are generally jumping in shoes just the way that our operation works and, and when they're jumping based on practice um, and just establishing a baseline. You know, I'd rather a guy jump in the shoes he's going to wear in the game than come in, jump barefoot one day, jump in sandals one day, and jump in shoes the next day. So it's hard for me to say there's direct correlations between X and Y. Um, but I will say that shoes make a big difference. Um, we have tended to do a lot more barefoot training in the off season because of this to try to counteract some of those things, strengthening the bottom of the feet. Um, I also think what we're seeing is that the, the athlete's foot is becoming highly desensitized um, and the proprioception is much less. And we have tested this and we have noticed a big difference. And we know that there's a correlation between increased proprioception um, and ankle stability. We know that. Um, and so we do look at some of those things. Um, I will say a general trend, though, is these guys are playing hours of basketball a day for many years coming up. They love their shoes. They're switching shoes all the time. And it's really killing the proprioception and just the strength and the arch of the foot. So do you guys have shoe fitters like Titleist would have club fitters or, or, or Palisades Tahoe would have ski boot fitters? Do you guys have that on staff? Yeah, so our equipment managers do a great job. Um, we actually, and a lot of this is just communicating with the athlete and, and feeling um, these things. We have certain shoes that certain guys prefer. And then we also will stretch shoes in certain ways to fit an individual's foot. So a size 14 may be different than a size 14 wide, you know, so we really look at, at those things as well. And that's a funny thing you bring up because these are conversations I have year round. Um, uh -huh. One of the first things I ask if a guy is, is having any sort of lower limb is I say, how are your shoes fitting? And I'm finding oftentimes, oh, I just switched shoes. 
okay, well, let, let's look at that, right? Maybe those shoes aren't broken in. Maybe they don't fit correctly. We always start there. Um, and, and, you know, that's a funny point that you bring up. But yeah, our equipment staff does a great job. We stretch shoes in different ways. We have different pairs for different guys. Um, even in the same brand, some pairs fit different than others. You know, it's, it's a game that we have to play, um, but it's another thing that we're looking at for sure. What's the best part of your job? Guy, you've been there a couple of years now. You're a California native by heart, you know, not too far away from your homeland in Sacramento. And now, you know, the golden child from the golden state is in the Bay Area. What, what, what's your, your pride and joy of what you do? You know, I think one of my life goals is to help people. Um, and I think that this job totally allows me to do that. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a specialist in any one thing, but I would say that in general, like the biggest specialty I have is the ability to address a concern or a need or, or help someone or find, help them find a solution to things. And so I, you know, that's kind of the cliche answer to what we do, but this job really allows me to, to help others and serve others. Um, and that's something that I've always believed in it more personally, you know, my grandfather played football at this school and I used to come, you know, to Cal basketball games growing up. So specific to this job and, and personal to this job, the best part of it is just being able to put on this logo every day and hopefully represent it well and, and, and work to make this, you know, an even better place than it already is. Yeah. You got to love that. Any aspirations of, going into professional ranks somewhere down the road, like 10 or 20 years, you know, I don't want you to lose your job after your <laughs> boss is here at this podcast. So, you know, you're not going anywhere for a while, but somewhere down the road, any aspirations of getting into the uh, NFL or uh, wherever? Yeah. You know, I, I never rule anything out. Um, I love the college setting. You know, I like working with the, the younger student athletes. You know, I think they're a special group. I like watching the development. Um, I like aiding in that, you know, so I, I wouldn't rule anything out. I've been doing basketball. I think this will be my ninth season coming up um, and I love the game and it's kind of my means of, of being able to do what I do. Um, and I think the professional, you know, arena is very different. Um, and we talked about that, you know, earlier on as it's just a different landscape, um, you know, and I don't know if one's better than the other, obviously the level's higher. Um, I'm a high achiever, you know, I, I like to work at the highest levels and, and with the best athletes in the world. So, you know, I'm not ruling anything out, that's for sure. Uh, but I really do love the college setting for many reasons. All right. So if the Warriors come knocking, just just know, Warrior execs, that the, the door is open is what you're saying. But let's talk about yeah. the tennis athletes, because you do say that with the exception of uh, physical contact, they're, they're very similar. But it's also the female body versus the the, the male body, um, of course, they're going to have similar injury sites, and it's kind of where my mind goes, but I'm thinking with, with tennis, you know, there's, there's rotator cuff, low back, ACL. Uh, what are the other high points of, of injury rates that you might see with a tennis athlete? Yeah, you know, and I think this is similar to basketball, patellar tendonitis. Uh, certainly, you, you talked about some of the, it being a racket sport, some of the, the shoulder um, or elbow injuries. Uh, low back is, is definitely something, just the amount of pounding and cutting, um, the rotation aspect adds more stress onto the lower back. Um, we see, you know, common to any sport, we see tight IT bands. Um, sometimes we see some things in the foot, uh, ankle complex. Again, this could be related to shoes or so insoles, um, which is more common than not. So the injuries are, are very similar. I would say one of the big thing, and this isn't an injury, um, but a big difference between it being an individual and a team sport is the, the mental piece. Um, and so there's different mental states that the athletes try to achieve or, or be into play. Um, and so that's kind of a piece that's, like I said, obviously it's not an injury, um, but it's, it's just a little bit different. Um, so I would say, you know, much like basketball, you have the lower limb stuff, you have the rotator cuff, you have the elbow stuff. But a big thing that we keep in mind, too, is kind of the mental state, the recovery, uh, the confidence levels and, and things like that. So do you throw in drills during their conditioning where there is chaos and, and a tremendous amount of stimuli visually hitting them from all directions? And they have to try and find their center. They have to work on breathing. They have to bring 
their their sympathetic tone down? Do you do anything like that? I'm just curious, I, I, not to throw you under the bus with all these questions. No, not at all. That's a great question. Um, we don't do too much of like external stimulus, but what we do try to do collectively as a program is we try to make things very challenging. Um, they are some great outdoor trails um, up here in the Berkeley Hills that will run and there's some very difficult parts, um, you know, and so we have team and program goals uh, to achieve like very challenging things. Um, sometimes we do do mental tasks as well. Um, you know, but I think kind of to answer your question, we try to create a very mentally stimulating and challenging uh, work environment, whether that be testing uh, their fitness levels or their strength levels. Um, you know, there's some program standards that we have um, and there's some things that we do that, that definitely challenge them from a mental side. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I could only imagine. Uh, and those hills are fabulous. I mean, hiking or running or whatever you're doing, it's just a gorgeous environment. And um, tell me a little bit about your background, like, um, your the sports that you competed in the the schools you attended the the path it took you to get to where you are today yeah so you know i think me working in basketball and, I, and i'll circle back to this like i said this is a i think it's my ninth season of, of doing college basketball um but i really fell in love with basketball as a kid growing up in sacramento um and we used to go to the, the sacramento kings games um, and watch the old Lakers rivalries with Shaq and Kobe, um, you know, and that's what I grew up watching and understanding as sport um, is that level of basketball and the teamwork that goes into that. So, um, you know, to pull back out, I also grew up uh, swimming. That was really big in our family. Uh, we came from a swim and like a, like a water family in Sacramento. Um, I played all the typical sports of baseball and soccer um, but really when I got to high school, I just loved basketball so much. So, um, in college, I knew that I wanted to go to a school and, and work in sport in some capacity. I didn't know what that path would be. Um, but it kind of got shown on me when, in, you know, in high school, as a basketball player, I got injured. I had to go to physical therapy and it clicked for me. And I said, wow, this is something that I could do where I could help people not feel what I felt and and help people stay on the court so i went to the university of texas for undergrad uh which is where i met todd wright um and that's kind of where i was like whoa there's much more to this than i thought and uh the level of the human body that todd knows is just completely deeper and different than i had ever imagined and so i fell in love with it and i remember i would just you know enjoy studying anatomy and biomechanics and physiology um, and I love basketball, you know, so I, in terms of my career, I was always looking at, at who are great basketball strength coaches, where could I go? And I stumbled upon P Preston Green at the University of Florida. Um, and I applied to grad school and basically didn't give an option. I said, hey, I'm coming to school here. I'm working for you. Um, when can we meet? And so I remember I, I showed up uh, and they were leaving for a postseason tournament. Um, and so he's like, I got 20 minutes, right? So I had 20 minutes and then he called me an hour later and he said, actually, my, you know, my assistant's leaving. I need another assistant here at Florida. And I was like, I'm in, you know, I had no idea what I was getting into. I was going there for grad school and here I was, I got my first shot at it. And I guess that's the way life works. Um, and I, again, it was just a, a complete culture shock to me about how much he knew. And it was very different than what Todd knew. Um, and so I just got lucky with him and, and he was a great mentor and it just really kicked off my career in, in college basketball strength training, spent a year at Florida Gulf Coast, uh, university down there in Fort Myers, Florida. So, um, that was a great time. We had a coaching change, which brought me up to the university of North Carolina at Charlotte. Um, so I spent two seasons there and then, you know, the Cal opportunity presented itself and, you know, I, I jumped at the opportunity to come back home. So that's my long winded way of saying I've been in college basketball and I love it. Uh, but it started at a young age and here I am. That's fabulous. You know, the, the one thing that I, I don't talk too often about is the level of, of, or the low level of job security that college and professional coaches uh, and you just alluded to it, you know, there was a coaching change. And so you, you found yourself somewhere else. Um, it, is that something that is uh, just a small dark cloud on the horizon you think about every now and then? Is it looming overhead? 
more often than not? Or do you, do you just don't think about it until the time come? What's that? What was that like? You know, I think it'd be naive to say that, that you shouldn't think about it or we don't think about it. Um, you know, I think as professionals, we try to be very prepared for our careers. Um, that being said, on a day to day basis, it's not really something we ever think about. You know, our days are, are about people and other people um, and other athletes. And that's the majority of my mental space most days. Um, and when I get home, is I'm always thinking about, you know, what's next at my current job. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think, you know, that's always something in the back of our mind. That's reality. Um, you know, it's not all roses every single day and that's the nature of sport. And you know, that getting into it is that's some of the things that you're going to have to deal with. Um, and so I've tried to prepare myself and be ready for opportunities if they present themselves and then just give everything that, that I can to, to where I'm currently at. So, you know, like I said, it doesn't take up a lot of mental space of mine, but it, it definitely is something I prepare for if, if it ever comes, but I've been lucky, you know, and not everyone can say that. So, um, who knows what will happen, but yeah. we'll be prepared for it and, you know, it'll work out. Yeah, you may think that you've been lucky, but uh, just from what you described, you you put the effort in and, and you stuck your neck out and you reached your hand out and, and you said yes when, when questions were asked of you and, and, and you took action. So it's more than luck. And uh, I know that you, you keep that trend going. And we'll see greater and greater things from you further down the road. So uh, I, I can't believe this has been already the, the full segment here and we got to bring it to a close. <laughs> but uh, this has been great, Blake. I'd love to have you back on maybe next season and, and kind of like a before and after through the basketball season, as well as kind of touch base on how your women's tennis team does in the Sweet 16, too. But this has just been a joy. I want to thank you. Yeah, no, like I said, it's, it's a pleasure of mine to be on here. I'd love to come back. Um, yeah, we'll fill you in. And in the meantime, I'll, I'll make it down to Santa Cruz. You can teach me how to surf. How about that? There we go. You got a deal. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate your time. This has been fantastic. Thanks, Rocky. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Zealous Podcast. Be sure to join us next week when we have another incredible guest. In the meantime, make sure that you subscribe and follow us on Instagram, Rocky underscore Snyder. I want to thank Blake Bender for coming on and joining the ranks, and we'll talk to you next week.